Welcome back to the channel. I appreciate y'all joining me. Some of you may have noticed if you follow on Facebook or on TikTok where I posted about Florida Flaming Six Gun. I'm going to read that to you today. This was originally printed in the June 1958 edition of Adventure Magazine. Now, the particular copy I'm going to read off today come off of the verbal genealogy side. Keep in mind, this is printed in a Pulp Fiction book. A lot of the names that they've used are real names. Are they really the names responsible for the deeds that they say? I don't know the answer to that, but we're gonna track it down and see if nothing else we'll learn something about these people. So don't get all upset because your family's one family or the other. We're just reading what's here and going to look and see what we can find. So first off, before we get started, this is about a supposed cattle war at the turn of the 1800s and 1900s in Taylor County between two families, the Tolls family and the Brandon family, slash Brandon, according to some. Now, it is very possible that's true. If you know anything about Taylor County history or you've been following any of my posts on the Civil War era in Taylor County, you'll know that the Tolls family, a lot of those earlier members, just one generation back from where this is talking about, which would have been their fathers, the Tolls family was on Captain Faulkner's brigade for the cow cavalry protecting cows in our area for the salt works. And a lot of the members of the Brandon family were uh, part of the, the union here. They were actually participating in cattle raids. So the circumstances there for there to be friction between the two families, there's no denying that. But whether there was or not, we don't know that, but we're gonna, we're gonna read this. And then in a few future videos, we're gonna break each part down by chapter. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started and read it to you. And then at the end, I'll tell you just my initial thoughts before really doing any research. It says, oh yeah, and by the way, if you've seen those uh, little clips I did when I referred to the two different cattle ranches, I referred to the Tolls Lazy 20, but when I typed out about the Brandon, it said, tree links i misspelled that by mistake and didn't catch that it was supposed to be three links a pulp fiction article about the wild west shooting wars between the brandon three links cattle ranch and the tolls lazy 20 cattle ranch although fiction the article is based on real events involving the brandon family in taylor county florida in the early 1900s Florida's flaming six gun starts off with an editor's note on the Burville genealogy site. It is with some trepidation that we post this article on our webpage. This article is from Adventure Magazine, a popular inexpensive pulp fiction magazine containing short adventure, fantasy stories, sold at corner newsstands and stores. It is thus entirely fiction written for reading entertainment rather than documenting actual events. The story is based on events that did occur around 1900 in Perry, Taylor County, Florida. And the characters in this story are based on real peoples using their real names as near as I can tell. Although fiction, the article may portray to some level of accuracy some of the conflicts and troubles of those difficult days. That is why we have elected to post this article. The reader, however, is advised to take its content with a large dose of common sense and reason before believing many parts of it. There is little doubt that there were serious conflicts between the Tolls Lazy 20 and the Brandlin Three Links cattle ranches. It is true that George Brandon, John Brandon, Henry Horace, and Thomas Brandon were formally arraigned on 3rd of April, 1901 in Taylor County for the first degree murder of Oscar and Howard King brothers who were riders for the Tolls Lazy 20 Ranch. George and John Brandon and Henry Horace pleaded not guilty and it was noted that Tom Brandon was killed on the 3rd of October 1899. He was apparently killed by Sheriff Lipscone and his posse who had gone to arrest him. The three remaining accused applied for a change of venue and the case was moved to Madison in Madison County, Florida where the trial was held in October of 1901. The jury could not reach a verdict, and after a retrial, where a verdict still could not be reached, the case against George and John Brandon and Henry Horse was dismissed. That editor's note is by J.T. Burville. I guess I'm pronouncing that right. It's B-U-R-V-A-L. 
But now we go down and it says, this is the actual story that they, they wrote out of the book, out of the article in the magazine. Florida's Flaming Six Guns, a fact story by Jack Murray. This story is based on actual events which occurred in the late 1800s and early 1900s. The house where the frolic was being held stood in a clearing near the creek, surrounded by a dense growth of scrub oaks and palmettos. The home of Tom Mercer was larger than most in that remote section of the Florida cattle country. And in front of it stood two china berry trees. The floor of the front parlor had been cleared for dancing. It was there that the fiddles sang and the high top boots of the cowmen shuffled to the ancient hoedown and jigs of hammocks, which had never known a round dance. It was there that the swaggering escorts swung the gay calico clad girls right and left to the nasal channel of the collar. In the plain oster bedroom across the hallway from the parlor, Jency Lanier, knee Brandon, sat on a high four poster bed, standing languidly as she coyly repulsed the advances of Bill Parker, who rode the Lazy 20 range for the Tolls brothers. Although Jency had married Tom Lanier, an improvident, shiftless man who has no part in this story, she was not disposed to allow her marriage vows to interfere with her pleasures and despite the bad blood between the Brandons and the Tolls. The inconsistent sister of the former dispensed her favors impartially between the riders of the two rival outfits. It's important you know too, most historians believe that Brandon was a name change from Brandon, related back to the Civil War and joining the Union. Parker looked up with a frown of annoyance as Dixon Waters, Perry's storekeeper, came through the door of with a casual nod to the toll rider, stood looking down with a quizzical smile at the girl sitting on the bed. Hiya, Jency, he said. Where'd you get the fan? Bill gave it to me. You like it? Sure, Waters took the fan from the girl's unresisting fingers and began to fan, hit fan and began to fan himself slowly. Sure, it's pretty. Then tossing the fan contemptuously back to its owner, he passed on into the hall. Parker's arm again encircled Jency's ample waist and he drew her close. How about a kiss, honey, he said. Come on, he urged, ain't you gonna be nice to me tonight? No, no, Bill, quit, not here. She pushed him back. Why not, Parker's low voice was hoarse and insistent as he attempted to push the girl back on the bed. No, where do you think you are, Bill Parker? You're half drunk. As she fought to extricate herself from Parker's embrace, the fan slipped out of her hand and fell behind the bed unheeded. Turn me a loose, Bill, she panted. Flushed with her effort, she squirmed from the rider's grasp and began to rearrange her ebon hair. Where's your fan, honey? Parker asked after a minute or two. Jesse looked around and over the rumpled bed. Why, I guess Dixon kept it. The hell he did, I'll see about that, Parker replied as he strode into the front room in search of waters. Not finding him there among the dancers, he passed on into the tight trodden yard where a jug of cane liquor passed from hand to hand. Waters lounged near the edge of a group. Dix Parker asked angrily, where's that fan, Jency's fan? Why, Bill, I tossed it back to her. I ain't got it. You're a damn liar, Dix, you have. Bill, Waters pronounced ominously. I don't quarrel at other folks' houses, and I don't want any trouble with you here at Tom's. But he paused impressively. Tomorrow's Saturday, and you'll be in town, and all your friends will be there, too. Tomorrow, you're going to apologize to me for calling me a liar. With these words, Waters turned by his back and walked slowly back toward the house. Okay, Dix, Parker growled as he fingered the gun which protruded from the waistband of his trousers. Okay, if that's the way you want it, I'll be there. And with this seemingly unimportant altercation, the events were set in motion, which precipitated the bloodiest range war of Florida's turbulent cattle frontier. Saturday morning broke cool in Perry the little Taylor County cow town nestling near the rim of the hammock which stretched back towards vast acres of virgin cypress and, and hardwood timber that had already attained a vigorous growth when Christ was crucified. In their vast somber recesses, with the sunlight filtering through their branches 50 feet or more above, one hears no sound save the tremendous of the stillness of the ages, here more forcibly than others in the entire peninsula. 
One is reminded of the littleness of man and the glory of his creator. But on this historic Saturday morning, there was to be little to remind one of the divinity of the Almighty. Soon after the turn of the century, the Brandon brothers, Tom, Walter, and Marion, had established the three link spread, which extended west to the waters of Dead Man's Bay. The tolls of San Pedro Bay and their holdings comprised many thousands of acres. It was a boast of Jim Tolles, leader of the Klan, that he could ride from Madison County line to the big waters of the Gulf of Mexico, east of the Finn Holloway River, and claim every cow track he saw. The Brandon outfit was equally as powerful on the right on the west side of the Finn Holloway, and each had warned the other to keep his stock on his own side of the river. By 1907, these two brands were running thousands of head of prime beef cattle, and each had from 75 to a hundred riders on their payroll, many of them gummen imported from Oklahoma, South Dakota, and western states. Perry, the county seat of Taylor County, was then the center of the industry and had several miles of loading pens. While there was a duly appointed sheriff and chief deputy in the respective persons of Judd Head and Evan Bunk Rhodes, the law of the six-gun ruled the cow country, much as it did in the early days of the Old West. In fact, the Florida Range was but a smaller replica of the wide open spaces with everything but the lariat. Instead of the lasso or rope, the Florida Cowboy is an expert in the use of a long lash stock whip. There had long been ill feelings between the Tolleses and the Brannons. Tom Brannon had warned Jim Tolles to keep away from his sister, Jency. Jim refused to heed the warning, and Tom swore to kill him. There ensued a long period of rustling and misbranding of Mavericks by both outfits which men were killed, the brothers Oscar and Houston King, Lazy 20 Riders, and the governor ordered Tom brought in for trial. The Brannons were then so powerful that they felt they could defy even the governor of the state with impunity. So Tom refused to come in and no one cared to take the job of bringing him in. A large part of the cattle rustling at the time was done by homesteaders or squatters who were having a hard time making a living and by cowboys this serious of making a few extra dollars for a spree. Typical of these later was John Connell, whose father ran the J-Bar 3 spread, and who admitted in later years that at the age of 16, he and a youthful partner, Lewis Harrell, rustled a carload of steers from his father's herd. When the boys tried to collect the $1,600 draft given in payment, the bank refused to honor it because they knew the boys owned no cattle. John called in his friend, Bill Parker, who laid down the ultimatum. I never robbed a bank or killed a banker, he told the cashier. But I'm going to go across the street to the saloon. If them boys ain't over there in 10 minutes with their money, I'm a coming back and get it and I may kill me a banker. In less than the allotted time, the boys had the money. A few weeks later, John took unto himself a wife and then used his share to proceed to furnish a cabin on J-Bar 3 land. On that epic Saturday morning in May 1910, Bill Parker and his brother Bob rode into Perry and tied their horses at the hitch rack behind Powell Brothers Taylor County Saloon. Dixon Waters sighted them as they walked around the street in front and he instantly dropped a piece of pine upon which he had been whittling, stepped inside the door of his store and buckled on his guns. Walking slowly up to Bill Parker, who stood some 25 feet apart from his brothers, Waters said, Bill, you're not in another man's house today, and you're not a sitting alongside a female. You seem to have the idea that you're a bad man. Last Saturday night, you drilled Tom McKnight over a two-bit winch. Now, if you're such a bad bear cat, show your clothes. And Parker did. He reached for the gun in his left-hand holster, and at the same time, with a knife tightly clutched in his right hand, slashed Waters across the stomach, ripping his belly wide open. Waters staggered back and three times his 44 belts flaming lead into the breast of Bill Parker, who dropped lifeless to the wooden sidewalk without firing a single shot. Why, you dirty son, Bob Parker yelled. You can't do that to no brother of mine. His gun bucked and roared as he poured two blasts at Waters. Waters staggered with the impact of the bullets, one slug passing through his left arm, and the other pierced in the fleshy part of his leg. He fired once and Bob Parker fell face down beside his brother. As Waters turned away, John Malcolm, another tolls rider, opened fire from across the street, his lead whistling past Waters' head. 
turning his attention to his new assailant, Porter silenced Michael's gun with a single well-placed bullet through the heart. Reeling as he stepped back from the crimson pool in which he stood, he dropped his smoking gun and tried to hold together the gaping wound in his belly, which the treacherous knife of Bill Parker had laid open. He staggered into Peacock's store, his breathing in tortured gasp as he fell across the counter in a vain attempt to hold himself on his feet. Slowly, he slumped to the floor and rolled over on his back and stared at the smoke-blackened ceiling with unseeing eyes. Elsie Church of the Lazy Twenty, who had been talking to Bob Parker when the shooting began, seemed paralyzed with the swiftness with which hot lead had snuffed out the lives of three of his friends. With a hysterical shout, he roused himself to action. Come on, all you damn Brandons. He yelled, discharging his gun in the air. Let's make it unanimous. Henry Horace, rider of the three links, dashed out of the saloon and took up the challenge. As smoke and flaming lead belched from his guns, Church staggered back against the brick wall. He dropped his empty gun and dragged his left-hand gun from its holster. Turning it in the direction of the roaring guns of Horace, he took careful aim. Once, twice, his bullet spread true to the mark. The third tearing a hole in the rough boards of the sidewalk in front of him. They had blasted each other down and both were dead before they hit the planes. By this time, the battle was raging all the way up and down Perry's Main Street. Preston Cox, the tax collector, stepped to the door of the courthouse to see what was happening, and a chunk of flying lead slammed him back through the open door. Colonel Gornto ran to the door of his store to gaze in horrified, amazement at the terrible havoc being wrought, his bloodless lips moving soundlessly in prayer. Lead splashed all around them. He spread his arms helplessly in silent supplication, his fine eyes blazing with divine fervor. A leaden missile turned him halfway around and he dropped in the doorway, his rumpled gray thatch slowly assuming the color of the gory pool in which it lay. When at last the smoke of the battle had cleared, the street was deserted save for the dead and dying. Walter Brandon and Bunk Paget, one of the riders, lay dead farther up the street, mute evidence of the efficiency of the guns of Deputy Sheriff Evan Rhodes, imported from Red Top, Oklahoma, as a peace officer. All told, three Brandons, and four of the Tolls outfit, and two innocent bystanders were killed, and many of both fractions sorely wounded. When the dead had been injured and carted away, Jim Tolls went to the saloon and bought a 30-gallon barrel of corn whiskey and rolled it to the east side of the courthouse square, which was acknowledged as Lazy 20 territory. He upended the barrel, knocked the head in, and hung a tin cup beside a crudely lettered sign on which appeared the legend, for friends of the Lazy 20. Not to be outdone in hospitality, the Brandons placed a similar barrel of liquor on the west side of the square for friends of the Brandons. Sheriff Judd Head, who had taken no part in the gun battle, wired the governor in Tallahassee, if you don't send troops to preserve law and order, a hundred will be killed before the week is out. I am resigning. Governor Park Trammell, later elected to the Senate, wired Frank Lipscomb, his appointment to fill the place vacated by Sheriff Head and assured him that a company of soldiers would arrive at two o'clock the next day. He also instructed the new sheriff to go out and get Tom Brandon dead or alive. After Tom Brandon had been outlawed for the killing of the Keen brothers, he sent to Georgia for Emmett Douglas to kill off the entire Paget family because they were suspected of rustling Brandon beef. The Pagets were said to be outlaws who came to Florida from Eccles, Georgia after the Cracker State got too hot to hold them. They brought a small herd of scrub cattle with them. As the Paget clan included some eight or 10 families, and as Brandon had not specified any exceptions to his term to get the whole damn bunch of them, Douglas set himself to figure out a plan whereby the job could be done with the greatest dispatch, and at the same time with as little personal risk as would be compatible with efficiency. Poison seemed to be the most logical method for a wholesale murder such as this. So on a certain moonless night, he visited the wells of the Pagets and dropped in each what he thought was a lethal dose of strychnine. He either miscalculated the dosage or perhaps the drug had deteriorated with age. In any event, the only harm it did was to make a few Pagets quite ill. There were no fatalities recorded. With the failure of his plan to poison the Georgia cattlemen, he decided to get them one at a time, even though it would take a little longer. He'd shoot them where he found them and leave them where he shot them. This plan 
was more effective, particularly in view of the fact that he always closely observed the primal law of self-preservation. Early one morning, Tom Paget rode out to relieve Hardy, who had been watching a small herd out in the scrub. Douglas hid in the dense palmetto growth and along the trail and shot him down as he came abreast of the hiding place. Douglas then slipped swiftly through the bush, crept as close as he dared to Hardy, who was dozing in the saddle waiting for his brother. A single shot from the 3030 Winchester accounted for number two of the ill-fated Paget family. He was doing all right thus far. Several days elapsed before another Paget crossed the sights of the Douglas rifle. Noly Paget was hazing a bunch of yearlings out of the creek bottom when a bullet slammed into his pony's rump. With a squeal of pain, the pony reared, pitching Noly over his head. The Paget rider rose to his feet, drew his guns, and blazed aimlessly in the general direction from which the mysterious shot had seemed to come. The volley from his revolver only served to point out to Douglas his exact location and the next shot from the rifle of Tom Brandon's hired killer crashed through Noly's brain. Number three was accounted for, but all good things must come to an end. The great vine of the African bush is no more effective than that of the Florida swamp country. The Padgett's knew full well who was responsible for the alarming decrease in their ranks, and so did Sheriff Lipscomb. So he appointed a man to bring Douglas in, a man he knew would not fail in his mission, J. Frank King. A surveyor and one of the best rifle shots in the country was a man of few words. He didn't elaborate much upon the method he used to get Douglas. He merely brought his dead body back to Perry with a report that he was killed while resisting arrest. By this time, Tom Brandon was badly wanted, but still made no attempt to leave the Three Links Ranch. Sheriff Lipscomb deputized Frank King, B. Tree Allen, John Church, and, a, and his brother Elsie Church, and Noe Paget, Noah Paget carry out the governor's orders. The posse rode down to Nine Mile Creek and hid in the scrub oak near Tom Brandon's line camp cabin. Early in the morning after Tom's riders had left for the brush, Tom came out and sat on a wooden bench on the shady side of the cabin. Sheriff Lipscomb climbed a tree and killed Tom with a shot from his 30-30. The posse carried the body back to Perry and a hastily impaneled Colonel North's jury returned a verdict came to his death by gunshot wounds at the sheriff of Lipscomb's posse while resisting arrest. He was buried near the old Brandon home site on Nine Mile Creek. That afternoon, Bob Striplin, farmer and peaceful advocate, went to the sheriff's office to remonstrate with him and to make a plea for the peaceful settlement of the disputes between the ranchers. Frank, he said, this bloodshed's got to stop. Bring some of these here troublemakers to court and send them to the penitentiary and they'll quit feuding. I'm a doing all I can, Bob. I got Tom Brandon this morning and I'll get the rest of them before I'm through. That's just it, Frank. You're as bad as the rest of them. Yes, sir. You climbed in a tree and killed Tom Brandon without giving him a chance. You know you did. Bob, the sheriff said quietly, you know that's a damn lie. No, it ain't. You murdered him in cold blood. You're a killer. Get out of my office, the sheriff ordered, his lips quiet and quivering. Get out, Stripling. To get out. Stripling stood his ground. Put me out, damn you. Put me out. The sheriff grappled with the intruder in a rough and tumble fist fight, with Lipscomb getting a little best of the argument. While Bill Wilder, operator of a small general store directly opposite the jail, was sitting on a wooden packing case in front of his place of business. Wild Bill had the reputation of being a trouble hunter and a bad man to cross. Seeing that Stripling was getting the worse of the fistic encounter, he rose slowly from his seat and kicked it back with his heels. As he reached inside the door for his gun belt, he told his wife, Maggie, this has gone far enough and I don't like the way Tom Brandon was killed a damn bit. He started across the street toward the office where the sheriff and Stripling were still belaboring each other. Come back, Bill, Maggie said. There's been killing enough. Please come back, she entreated. Don't start any more trouble. Bill never slackened his pace, nor looked back. This country's too damn small for me and Frank Lipscomb, and I aim to stay. He flung grimly over his shoulder. When he reached the door, he called to the sheriff. Frank, turn Bob loose. I'm ready for you. As he threw up his hands in a token of peace, Wilder's gun spat fire, and one bullet tore through the sheriff's upraised hands while another shattered his right elbow. Wilder walked closer and calmly drove another bullet through the helpless Lipscomb's heart. 
ramming fresh shells into his gun as he started back across the street while Bill muttered to himself, well, I might as well kill the other polecat while I'm about it. He turned and went slowly up the street toward where Chief Deputy Rhodes was standing by the Louisiana lunchroom. Rhodes saw Bill coming and knew what he was coming for. He cupped his hands to his mouth and called, don't come up town, Bill. If you do, I'm going to kill you. Rhodes walked around the corner and stepped through the side door into the restaurant, standing just inside the open door. He saw Bill as he turned the corner 50 feet away. Rhodes then sprang out on the sidewalk facing Wilder at the same time, drawing his 44 single-action Smith & Wesson. His first shot struck Bill in the stomach. Wilder's gun roared three times and all three bullets tore into the boardwalk at his feet. He fell upon his face and rolled over lifelessly. Turning to bystanders, Rhodes said, Boys, you know I had to do it. You all know Bill and knowed he was a dangerous man. No one replied and noting the hostile looks on their faces of the men around him, he said disgustedly, This is one hell of a town. I'm going to catch the first train out of it. Then he started for the depot a quarter mile away. Jim Barbie, a Brandon Ryder, got his pony and cut around through the scrub ahead of Rhodes, picking up John Morgan and four other men as he went. The Oklahoma gunman had to pass a thick clump of head high dog fennels on his way to the railroad, and as he came abreast of the high weeds, a volley of bullets riddled him. Deputy Parker was appointed to fill Sheriff Lipscomb's place. The day immediately following the death of Sheriff Lipscomb and Deputy Rhodes were the most peaceful that Taylor County had seen for many years. The presence of the soldiers had a psychological effect on the cowmen and they stayed close to their homes until martial law was lifted. It was not long after the departure of the militia, however, that the ranchers renewed their regular quarrels and men began to dye lead poisoning with old time regularity. Evan Lambert, a half-breed Seminole Indian, had taken a homestead a few miles from Perry, and Bob Paget jumped his claim. Paget built a cabin on Lambert's land and was on the roof one morning on top, working on his chimney. Lambert hid in the adjacent scrub oaks and shot him off the roof with a rifle. A short time later, Ollie Keene, a Brandon Ryder, ran the Indian down with dogs and killed him. Beatree Island was suspected by Jim Tolles of being a Brandon spry, spy. So as he was making the rounds of his traps one morning, he was waylaid and killed by Roy and Harrison Padgett, who shot him from an ambush. Eventually, the Brandons and the Tolls, as well as many of the other pioneers, killed each other off, died, or left the county. And as few new ranchers came in and acquired land and timber, those who remained began to have a more wholesome respect for the law. Now, after that, it goes on to tell you how the lumber industry came and things changed and a lot of the cowmen moved off and went other places and things leveled out. So we're not going to really get into that. Uh, but pretty neat story. So, say you remember there was a feud if you'd been listening and reading in history between the Brandons and the Tolls that dated all the way back to the Civil War. So, in the next few videos we're going to do, we're going to break down each section of this and research it and hunt these people and see what we come up with. Anyhow, I appreciate y'all joining me and keep following along. If you hadn't hit that subscribe button.